Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay. We have some technical problems. Uh, this is Glenn Fairclough, the administrator for the Utah Public Notice website. And we're excited to bring you today's training. Today's training will help local districts and special service districts to be in compliance with recent legislative changes, including public notice and requests for records. Our training today is in four different segments. Um, the primary focus will be on the uh, open records portal, which uh, the third and final phase has been implemented at the beginning of the year. Uh, other topics will cover the uh, public notice website, the Government Records Access and Management Act, or GRAMA, and records management essentials. Um, we have, as I mentioned, four segments. I'll be taking the first segment talking about the public notice website. Uh, following me, Nova Dubovic, who is the Executive Secretary for the State Records Committee, will be teaching us about GRAMA and also about the records officer certification that's available to GRAMA responders. We'll have a scheduled break of about three minutes. And um, following our break, Lorianne Outerkirk, the records analyst for local government, will be talking about records management basics and uh, also the new certification for records officers. And Lorianne, uh, Renee Wilson, uh, who is the administrator for the Open Records Portal, will wrap things up. If you have questions, uh, please use the chat function and submit questions. And uh, we'll probably be answering the questions uh, at, at, at the end of each segment. And the slides and the audio will be available uh, on the internet in about a week. So we'll switch headsets and continue here. Um, okay, I wanted to move to the next slide. Okay. So the Utah Public Notice website is dedicated to bringing greater accessibility to public notice information and increased participation by the public. It is a central source for all public notice information statewide, and this information is provided in a standardized format for publishing. It allows the public to subscribe either by an RSS feed or by email to a body to receive the notices and updates that are published. And public notice informs members of the general public of government and government-related activities which may uh, concern their local area, municipality, county, or state. These are screenshots showing the home page of the public notice website and the About tab. The Utah Public Notice website was created by the 2007 legislature. When uh, the public notice website was launched the following year in 2008. Municipalities and special districts with an operating budget of under $1 million were exempted. And this exemption expired December 31st of 2012. So as of that date, uh, all special districts are now required to comply with the various requirements to post public information. The Open and Public Meetings Act uh, found in Title uh, 52, Chapter 4 of the Utah Code, mandates that notice and the agenda of all public meetings be available to the public. And requirements for other types of public notice can be found in more than 60 statutes in the Utah law. And these statutes can uh, regulate actions of state agency bodies and commissions, and many can be found in laws that govern counties, and municipalities and local or special districts and other references, even some as uh, obscure as the uh, Utah, Utah Uniform Probate Code, which uh, if it's uh, if they haven't been the courts haven't been able to um, determine a residence, locate a person by any other means, then uh, publish they publish on the public 
notice website. Uh, and some specific mandates, public notices must not only be posted on the Utah Public Notice website, uh, but also on the Utah Legal Notice website. Uh, but posting only on, if it's required to post to both, um, you're not um, posting only on the legal notice website doesn't uh, relieve a body from also posting on the public notice website if that's also legally required. Um, a lot of people think that there's one blanket set of requirements for everyone to post on the public notice website, but this isn't the case. Uh, there are there's just some confusion because three different subsections uh, in the Open and Public Meetings Act, and these outline different requirements for state government agencies, for legislative bodies of a county, a city, or a town, and then a catch-all category for everyone else. And uh, I've created a table, and this is found uh, in the helpful questions and answers section uh, under the help tab uh, in the administrative section when you're logged in. And this is a handy reference tool for determining which requirements apply to which category. And from time to time, I hear from people uh, who have uh, done a self-assessment questionnaire, and it's made them uh, aware of the need to post uh, on the public notice website. Um, the auditors are checking the Utah public notice website for compliance, and last month, I. Uh, received a request from the auditor's office uh, requesting a list of special districts which are not uh, posting notices. So we want you to be aware that uh, that is happening and, and encourage you to be in compliance. Um, so a new requirement uh, came into being uh, last year. This is uh, as a result of Senate Bill 99. Uh, the transparency for political subdivisions. And this new requirement uh, is that special districts post um, the contact information, the name and contact information for each member of the board. So their name, uh, a telephone number, and an email address. And this can be, uh, there's been some concern uh, about privacy and, and posting someone's personal email address or telephone number. Um, so uh, some districts are posting uh, a general number for uh, an office number, uh, an office email address, and, um, and being in compliance that way. So entity account owners, those with the administrative capability uh, to go beyond posting to do some um, updating of information, they can add up to 20 uh, contact uh, the names and contact information for up to 20 board members. Uh, there are a few, uh, especially among the uh, associations of government that uh, do have more than 20 members. If that's the case, please uh, give me, uh, please contact me. Um, and that same warning uh, that uh, the state auditor is looking for compliance and um, did request a list of those that are in compliance with this particular section of the law. So here's a recap of what you should be doing. Uh, you should post notices and agenda on the Utah Public Notice website and make public materials available uh, in the business office during normal business hours. Post the name, telephone number, and email address of each board member on the Utah Public Notice website and contact me uh, if you need assistance. Uh, if I'm not available, uh, Renee is the designated backup, and, and uh, if I'm not available, she can, she can help you. Uh, here are some resources. Uh, the principal resource would be the website itself, uh, utah.gov slash PMN. And um, on the Utah State Archives website, there is a page uh, with information about the Utah Public Notice website. Here you'll find a comprehensive website manual to help users to um, perform the different functions that they need, step-by-step uh, -step instructions illustrated with screenshots. Um, it's a 63-page manual, so it is comprehensive. 
there's an abbreviated version that's only six pages long um, that uh, is more for uh, a quick reference. Uh, maybe you've forgotten something and just need a quick refresher, quick reminder of how to do something, and that's a good source. On the website itself, uh, as mentioned previously, there is the helpful questions and answers section, um, and that has lots of good information. Um, are there any questions uh, coming in from? Yeah. Okay, we had a question about a recommendation for not posting personal addresses uh, on the portal. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, some agencies are using uh, a, a business, the business telephone number uh, for the for the special service district or uh, a general email address that might go to the to the secretary, and then she would pass that information along to to the individual. Um, our director reminds us constantly, uh, frequently anyway, that um, that uh, accounts are uh, there are free accounts available, uh, Google and and Yahoo and and others that. Uh, you could use just for that purpose of, of responding to requests or being in compliance. Uh, the trick here, I guess, is is checking uh, with some frequency to make sure that that um, for uh, contact communication from outside. Other other questions. Um, I. I can't see that. That's That's cool. Glenn, uh, here's another question. How do we add board members to our site? Okay, how do you add board members to the site? Um, so this is something that can be done by those with an entity owner account, and you would edit or add the names of board members just the same way that you would edit the body template. So from the uh, dashboard on the left hand side you would go to the subheading that says body and then click search and then click edit there is a section at the bottom uh, under the contact name for for you for the person to contact for information about that particular body uh, there are three empty fields one for the body member name one for the body member uh, telephone number and one for the body member email address. So you would enter the name of one individual, the information for, for one individual, then you would click the add button and you would repeat that for uh, all members of the board. Once you've finished, you would click the save button at the bottom of the page and uh, that will add those that you need. Uh, when it comes time to edit, uh, we've just had uh, an election, um, there may be resignations, there may be uh, the end of uh, an individual's term. Um, so go back in exactly the same way and then delete the name of the person that's being replaced and then add the name of uh, any new members to the body the same way that I described and save that and um, that will be updated. So keep that in mind whenever uh, there, are, there are changes on the board. Remember to update. Let's not uh, uh, have a, a old information. Any, okay. any, other, any questions? other questions? Yes. So one question, a couple questions that are similar. Are interlocals required to add board members? And have you discussed requirements for interlocals? And do they all have to list board members? OK, yes. Uh, local districts are required to list the board members and i didn't quite catch the the last question so yeah the requirements for interlocals would be interlocals and local would be the same as for special districts okay. that's it okay um i guess we're ready to turn the mic over to Nova Dubovic.
All right, hello. My name is Nova Debovic, and I am the Executive Secretary to the State Records Committee. Today, I'm going to talk to you about two paths for records officer certification that is tailored for duties and responsibilities you perform. Uh, Lorianne is going to take the second half of the training and talk about the records management portion. Mine is going to be grandma. Uh, prior to 2016, there was only one way a records officer could certify annually, and that was by taking the records access or grandma certification, whether you handled grandma requests or not. So before we get ahead of ourselves, let's go ahead and go over some basic responsibilities. Okay, so if you are a chief administrative officer, and we're going to call it that the CAO for um, the purposes of brevity, your responsibilities include establishing a records management program, appointing records officers, and ensuring that they certify annually. As a records officer, if you're an appointed records officer, your responsibilities regarding records may include care and maintenance, scheduling and disposal, classification and designation, providing access, and preserving. Uh, here at the State Archives, we also recognize that many governmental entities divide these responsibilities among different records officers. Uh, for example, some records officers are responsible for the care, maintenance, and scheduling of records, but not for classifying or providing access to records. And then some records officers only classify records and respond to grammar requests. Uh, most records officers have both responsibilities, and this is especially true in small agencies, such as your special service districts. So one responsibility that we know can't be shared or redistributed is certifying annually. And according to the Utah Code, every records officer must do this, except records officers of the legislature and courts. So there are two paths to certification, like I mentioned before, a training that focuses on records access, grandma, and a training that focuses on records management. Um, both certifications will be available for every records officer. Um, records officers who are responsible only for grammar requests must take the records access certification test. Records officers who have only records management responsibilities are not responsible for responding to grammar requests may certify by taking the records management certification test. And then records officers who have both responsibilities may certify by taking the records access certification test the first time and thereafter may certify by taking the records management and records access certification test alternately every other year. So the first path that we're going to discuss is the records access certification, um, also known as GRAMMA. Okay, so if your responsibilities include responding to the grammar request, classifying records, and disclosing public, private, protected, and controlled records, then you will need to take the records access certification. Um, it's important before beginning the test to, of course, download the grammar statute, and then we also have training manual provided uh, where the statute's written in layman terms that will help you uh, pass the test, and that's available on the archives website or the open records portal on your dashboard. Um, so to give you a quick overview for more comprehensive grandma uh, training experience, I highly recommend that you attend one of our uh, annual trainings that we hold here at the archives. And also you can invite us out and we will do regional training in your area. So, oh, we have a question. Yes. Who is the question by? By Mallory. Ah, so Mallory. Oh, Mallory. I'm getting feedback. Oh, sorry. Um, which, if you are a special service district and do it all, which one would be the best training? Um, very good question. My recommendation is to do the grammar certification. Um, to give yourself a break, I would recommend doing the records management in alternate years. But but if you just want to do the, the grammar certification, that'll be fine if, if you do both. Um, if you have both responsibilities.
Okay, so this this um, slide presentation goes over what is in the training manual, so you get familiar with that. So this is just a general overview of grammar and what would be covered in the training manual. So the grammar certification test is broken down into six sections that reflect the contents of the law. The test can be retaken as many times as needed to obtain a passing score. That's good. However, it must be noted that the last four sections um, in the law, you do not need to know to pass the test. But I highly recommend or advise that you review and become familiar with those just on your own. Um, so in addition to the legislative intent, there's also a list of 30 definitions in module one. The definitions provide the legal meaning of terms used within the law and the records officer should refer to them when unclear on the context in the provisions. Um, records officers should know a few important definitions readily. So we also talk about the records of security measures, disclosure of records subject to federal law, and certification of records officers in module one. So legislative intent. The law outlaw outlines the legislative intent for creating grandma. They were, you have a question? Oh, okay, we have another question, Randall Knight. What is estimated time to complete the review and take the test? Um, I've heard from anywhere from an hour to two to three hours, and some people have started and then have gone back and finished it um, when they're able to. That's when they can start. Yes, you can start and stop. Thank you, Gun. Okay. So, okay, so go back to the legislative intent for creating grandma. Um, they were trying to promote the public's right to easy access to public records and at the same time to permit the confidential treatment of some records uh, when interest in restriction outweighs the access. Uh, and it also further stated the purpose of this act is to establish fair and reasonable records management practices. So that's the intent of grandma. So in addition to the legislative intent, like I mentioned before, there's definitions. And one, I'm not going to go over this a whole lot because Lori Ann's going to take it, but is the meaning of records. A record means a book, a letter, a document, and really what you need to focus on is regardless of the physical form or characteristic. Um, and also that it is prepared, owned, received, or retained by a governmental entity and the record must be um, reproducible by photocopy or other mechanical or electronic means. The law also goes over what is not a record. So we have personal emails and documents that are not work related, temporary drafts created for personal use, books contained in a library, junk mail or spam, and computer programs. Another definition that uh, is good to know is a governmental entity, which is the state executive department agencies and offices, legislator and its offices, committees, courts, state funded institutions of education and political subdivisions. Essentially, if you're funded by the public, then you'd be considered a governmental entity. Individuals and person. Um, grandma refers often to person within the law, especially in provisions of access and fees. And it's just important to know that a person is an individual, um, could be an organization or a combination of um, all of them. So record security measures. In part one, it talks about um, Security plans, security codes, combinations and passwords, pass keys, these are not subject to grandma. So it's, it specifically outlines that. A disclosure of records subject to federal law, HIPAA, um, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, including medical records identified as protected by HIPAA and controlled or maintained by the governmental entity are not subject to grandma. Um, also in the law, it uh, identifies FERPA as not being subject to grandma, but we don't cover that in the training manual. 
And lastly, in module one, um, the certification of records officers that we talked about earlier. So module two is access to records. Um, as a records officer whose responsibility is to respond to grammar requests, module two and, and part two of the law is probably the most important module and part to understand and be able to apply. Um, this section delineates the public's right to access government records. It answers questions such as who has the right to inspect records, what restrictions exist, who has rights to access restricted records, and it also details how to properly access and apply fees, time limits to respond to grammar requests, the different responses that you can apply, to who, um, who to include when you're denying a request, what to include when denying a request, and the process for the requester to appeal a records request denial. So who does have the right to inspect a record? The right to inspect records and receive copies. Every person has the right to inspect records and receive copies during normal working hours. Um, the governmental entity is not required to create a record unless it doesn't interfere with governmental duties and responsibilities and the requester agrees to a fee. And access cannot be hindered because the record is electronic or in a relational database. So who can you disclose records to? So private records are disclosed to the subject of the record, parent or legal guardian, or someone with a power of attorney or a notarized release. Controlled records are released to a physician, psychologist, certified social worker, insurance provider, or producer. Um, has to have a signed acknowledgement of the terms of disclosure of information must be provided. And then protected records are provided to the person who submitted the record, who has a power of attorney um, or has a power of attorney or a court order. Um, a submitted record could be a copy of a bid contract you submitted, proposals, applications, or any other information you have submitted to the governmental entity. And most important, you want to verify the identity of the requester before you release those records. Okay, so when a records officer receives a grammar request, um, he or she has 10 business days after receipt to respond, and there's four ways that you can respond. You can approve and provide the records. You can deny. You can notify the governmental entity does not maintain the record. You can notify the requester of an extraordinary circumstance, and there's eight extraordinary circumstances listed in the law. Um, if you do claim extraordinary circumstances, you must notify the requester within the 10 business days that you have that they have the right to appeal the extraordinary circumstance claim if they disagree with the reason or date the records um, will be provided. So also in module two, we talk about fees, denials, and sharing records and subpoenas. So fees. Um, Grandma states that a governmental entity may charge a reasonable fee to cover the actual cost of providing a record. Uh, for state agencies, fees are established by legislature. Local governments should establish fees by ordinance or written formal policy. And it's a good idea to establish a fee schedule that includes copying costs. A fee schedule is provided consistently and let requesters know what to expect. Um, no surprises. And in some instances, fees may be waived. Grandma encourages waiving the fee when the request benefits the public rather than the specific individual. We think of that as far as um, the media a lot of times. A person who requests a record to obtain information for a story, a report, or a publication, or broadcast to the general public. That would be considered benefiting the public. And then also Grandma encourages the waiver of fees if the requester is the individual who is the subject of the record or the legal guardian or legal representative and for impecunious requesters or individuals. So before processing a request, a governmental entity may require a payment of past fees or of future estimate fees if fees are expected to exceed $50 or if the requester has not paid for the previous request. Any excess must be refunded to the requester. 
and fees cannot be charged for reviewing a record to determine whether it's subject to disclosure or for allowing a requester to inspect the record. So denials. Um, when denying access, either in whole or in part, a governmental entity must provide a written notice of denial. The notice of denial must contain the following information, a description of the record's access to be denied, legal citation um, from grandma or any other statute, a statement requester has right to appeal a decision, time limits for filing an appeal, which is 30 days, and in the name of business address for the chief administrative officer. That needs to be in the denial, the written denial notice. So this is just a grammar process chart. Uh, this just covers what we've already gone through, talks about the 10 business days, uh, the determination whether you approve and provide, then you notify the requester of the governmental entity's decision. You can approve, provide the records, or you deny. If you deny, you go on to the next step, which is to provide the written response um, that the requester has the right to appeal to the, the decision to the chief administrative officer. So sharing records. Um, records that are restricted from public access through classification of private control protected or that are restricted by some other statute can be shared through written agreement within government. And Grandma outlines in, in broad terms the entities um, which sharing records is appropriate. Here's a list of some. Um, governmental entities that share records with other governmental entity, entities should notify the recipient of the records classification. And the recipient must abide by that classification determined by the creating agency. So they are not to release that record if you state that it is classified private or protected. Um, they cannot uh, go against that agreement that you have. And then a subpoena. Um, a subpoena is a court ordered request for disclosure of records. It is an order from a court for a person to appear or to provide records under punishment for failure to appear or produce, and it must be signed by a judge of a competent jurisdiction. Um, a subpoena is part of the judicial process and should not be responded to without the help of legal counsel, and a subpoena should be turned over to the attorney who represents the agency immediately as there are critical time limits involved. And just to note, a subpoena is not a grammar request. So that concludes module two. Um, you go into module three, which is also part three of the law and its classifications. And we have public, private, controlled, and protected. So public records. Public records are open meetings, meeting minutes, uh, financial records, initial contact reports, government contracts, and all records not specifically restricted in the law. Um, remember it this way, all records are public unless otherwise expressly stated in the law. Private records, if you work a lot with private records and controlled records, it helps to understand that they are both records about individuals, um, although the disclosure restrictions are vastly different. So a private record can be personal data and information on a person. Um, if released to someone other than that person, it would clearly be an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. And then controlled records. Like I mentioned before, controlled records pertain to an individual's medical data. And if released to that individual, could be detrimental to the individual or the safety of others around them. Uh, it's also important to note, releasing controlled information would be a violation of medical ethics. And then the last classification is protected records. There is currently 65 protected records listed. So if you have them memorized, you're still good. And protected records cover bids for contracts, trade secrets, proprietary information, test questions and answers, um, such as like at a a licensing, your driver's license, they wouldn't give out a test questions and answers, so that would be considered protected. Drafts, attorney-client privilege, um, and records release could interfere with government process such as an audit, an exam, an investigation, or a trial. Module four covers appeals. It's also part four in the law. So not all re uh, records officers 
work with appeals or had the opportunity to sit in on a committee hearing. Some of you may have, but most have not. However, it's important to familiarize yourself with the process because it impacts records access decisions made at your level and those at the chief administrative officer's level. So we're at the point where the requester has the right to appeal the governmental entity's decision. Um, and that first appeal must go to the chief administrative officer, the CAO, or the designee of the governmental entity. And the requester may appeal 30 days after the notification of the denial. Um, in addition to the denial, the requester may also appeal unreasonable denial of the fee waiver request, claims of extraordinary circumstance if the requester believes it is unreasonable, and if the governmental entity failed to respond within the time frame required by statute, which is the 10 days, 10 business days. Once the chief administrative officer has responded, the next level is to the local appeals board if you have one established. If not, the CAO's decision may be appealed to the state records committee or district court. And this is just another flow chart that breaks it down. So we are at the five business days for a chief administrative officer. That's how long they have to respond. Um, there's 12 business days for a business confidentiality claim, but I'm not gonna go into that. It's a little bit more complex. But they have five business days to respond, so they determine whether to approve um, access to nine whole or part, or if they just don't respond and they're upholding the denial. They notify the requester and they can approve or deny. If they deny, they go on and they notify the requester they have the right to appeal the decision. And again, they provide a written response, the right to appeal, 30 days to file an appeal, who to file appeal with, Again, if you have a local appeals board, it must go to the local appeals board first. That's in the law and that was changed in 2016. Um, if you don't have a local appeals board, it can either go to district court or to the records committee. So module five uh, covers, um, let's see. Module five is part seven of the law and it contains information on political subdivisions. So that's really important for you to take a look at and their ability to adopt ordinances and policies to comply with the statute. Uh, it also outlines what information should be written into your ordinances or policies to include the new state requirements for the local appeals board if you do have a local appeals board. Um, and a political subdivision may also establish its own reasonable response times and time limits for appeals. If you write ordinances and policies, it's important to become familiar with this module. And then module six lists four parts not included in the records access certification test. These parts might pertain to your duty, so it's important to review those parts, which are the state records committee, collection of information and accuracy of records. It's the provision that identifies the rights of individuals about whom data is maintained and the approval retention schedules. Remedies, this provision defines criminal penalties and liabilities associated with um, grandma, violation of grandma, and then public associations. And I guess I read everything. So this is just basically what I just went over. Um, also, the judiciary, the legislative, and the staff offices, they're exempt from portions of grandma. They're not subject to the State Records Committee appeals process and responsible for managing and retention schedules of their own records. And they're not subject to grandma fee schedules. So also in part seven, ordinances and policies. And this is just what I went over. The standards for designation of records require classification, guidelines for the establishment of fees, standards for the management retention of the entity's records. The part seven is very important for records officers. And then module six, I've already listed this, the state records committee is in there, collection of information, accuracy of records, the remedies, and the public associations. So if this is part, of your duties that we just went over for the for records access, um, then you need to take the grandma test. Um, if it is not, then what Lori Ann has to go over is probably more um, 
to what you need as far as your duties. And I think we're taking a three minute break. Okay. If an appeals board hearing subject to the Open and Public Meetings Act, that be noticed on the public website? An appeals board. So I just got a question about appeals board if it's, if it's um, if it's subject to the Open and Public Meeting Act, and it is, uh, you need to post it on the public notice website, and um, you should have an agenda posted on there. Okay, so uh, Randall Knight, I had a lawyer ask for a record. I asked him for a written certified letter from his client. Garmin is requesting a lot from small districts. Um, yeah, this is not something I'm going to be able to answer, but it, it sounds to me like you would need to talk to the legislature and request funding. Um, we definitely understand your pain out there. Looks like we have another person typing in. Okay, so if there is a denial, we don't refer them to the CEO, but to the records committee. No, so at the government, at the governmental entity level, the records officer level, when you deny a grammar request in whole or part, you let the requester know that they have 30 days to appeal to the chief administrative officer. Um, after they have appealed to the chief administrative officer and received a decision, if you do not have a local appeals board, then it would go, they can appeal to the state records committee or to district court. Is that what you're asking, Sharice? Okay. Yeah, it, they need to appeal to the chief administrative officer to perfect the appeal. Anybody else? Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a three minute break. You're more than welcome to send your questions to us um, after this presentation. Um, so we'll take a three minute break and I'll turn it over to Lori Ann. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. My name is Lori Ann Outerkirk. I recognize a lot of names on the chat feed. So I think I've met quite a few of you and I'm excited to just spend some time talking to you. Uh, Nova went over a lot about the grandma certification, and I'm going to talk about the second certification option, and that is certification in records management. One of the um, reasons that we developed this training, as Nova stated, was so that those records officers who do not have responsibilities in handling grandma requests or responding to grandma requests, but their responsibilities are with retention schedules and um, scheduling records, transferring records, disposing of records. We wanted those records officers to have a training specific to their responsibilities and needs. The training is divided up into multiple sections. And the first section goes over laws related to records management, namely the Public Records Management Act and the Government Records Access Management Act. And within those two laws, there are definitions related to records management, a warning, and then duties within um, government agencies as well as 
duties the State Archives has to assist agencies with records management. So let's just take a second and look at some of the definitions that are included in the training. I'll give you a minute to read over this list. Okay, these definitions of these terms are found in GRAMMA, but they apply to records management and to the records management laws found in the Public Records Management Act. Um, the training goes over the definitions and also explains how these terms and concepts apply to records management. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these in a minute. The law always, excuse me, also addresses responsibilities um, and it comes with this um, warning to the to um, government agencies that it's illegal to intentionally destroy, mutilate, damage, or dispose of a government record contrary to a properly adopted retention schedule. And the training covers um, why that is and what you can do to make sure that you don't do that. Um, largely, it has not been a problem in my experience, but we do like to educate records officers that that is included in the law. And then section one also covers duties. There's duties that lie within the governmental entities their responsibilities with records management, and then also the duties of the archives, what we um, are responsible for as far as assisting agencies in records management, and also um, services that we provide. Section two talks about principles of records management. In this section, isn't so focused on the law, but rather best practices. And the intent of this section is to help you to um, create a vision for yourself and for your agency to take you from maybe something that you're feeling like your records look something like this picture and transition into you know a vision that looks like this, where all your records have a place, you know where your records are, you know how to access them, um, so that your records management program is very clean and and easy to to execute. Then we go on to section three, and this section is a little bit longer than the other ones. It covers ten practical steps for implementing retention schedules, and we'll talk a little bit about that here. Um, these are the ten steps. I'll give you a second to read those. For those of you who have been involved with your records management program at any stage, I'm sure you can understand that these 10 steps are um, important. And there's also can be quite a few sub steps that come with each step. Um, but we tried to design the training so that it um, helps you to make a plan for your records and to move forward with that plan and um, helps you to evaluate and then, of course, um, continue to improve your plan. So um, although there are, there are these 10 steps listed, we have tried to um, focus the content to be most helpful to you and also to address what we call points of pain. And these are questions that we get a lot from records officers, gaps in understanding that we have um, learned about as we've worked with different agencies. And some of those points of pain include retention schedule types. Um, retention schedules are important to them after the retention is met. There are a couple of different types of retention schedules. There are the general retention schedules, which 
the State Archives publishes, publishes and maintains. Um, and those are available for any governmental entity to use as published. There's also the series specific retention schedule and those retention schedules um, can exist for an agency for a couple of different reasons. One reason is that maybe the agency has records that um, do not fall under a general retention schedule. And so we need to create a unique schedule for that agency for that particular record type. That's one reason why we would work with an agency to create a series specific retention schedule. The second reason is that the agency wants to use one of the archives services and so we need to um, collect data about the records in order to manage that service for them. Um, if you have questions about this, you know, and you want more specific um, advice about about your records and your retention schedules, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to go over your particular situation. Um, this is just a general overview, but I understand that you know each agency is unique, and so I'm happy again to talk to you about your specific retention schedules. And my contact information will be at the end of this slide, or excuse me, at the end of this presentation. Okay, another point of pain that we um, have seen, a question we get a lot is, I uh, say an agency calls us and says, we have all these different copies of a record, which copy do I need to keep? And um, the answer to that is, well, which one is your record copy? Which one have you decided is your official copy? And there are several um, things to consider with that. And the training goes over those different um, items, questions you need to ask, decisions you need to make. But essentially, what it comes down to is you choose your record copy and you commit to keeping that record accessible for the duration of its retention. And you manage that record as well as any additional copies that may exist and um, preserve it as, as um, necessary according to the retention schedule. And then when the retention is met, you either transfer it if it's a permanent record or you destroy it, just depending again on the retention schedule. Another question we get is about electronic records, namely social media, emails, instant messages, and database systems. And if you recall what Nova talked about with what is a record, the format of information is not a determining factor whether or not it is a record or not. It's the content that determines if it is a record. And so along with that, agencies may have information in their social media accounts, in their email, instant messages, or their databases that are government records. And that is highly, highly likely for database systems um, I don't know that I've ever met an agency that had a database system that did not contain records. And emails as well, um, and, and some messages and social media, um, you would have probably some type of record information. And that can be a little bit overwhelming, but again, um, when we look at more specifics as far as what it is you're using those items for, the platforms for of social media, um, we could work together in, in looking at that and making a plan for, for your agency. But this training just covers um, basic considerations for those and that these can be records. Um, along with the database, we get questions about how to schedule the database, what's the retention of my database. And the answer to that is that your database itself is not a record. The information contained therein is a record. And so we would look at what information is contained in your database and then schedule that record and have a retention schedule for the different groups of records. <clears throat> okay, just an overview in managing electronic records. Um, again, it comes down to just establishing a plan for 
how you're going to manage those records if you need to reformat the records in order to keep them as long as the retention requires, if you need to migrate from one system to another, and what your storage options are, and um, some future possibilities. Okay, so step nine of those um, 10 steps was transferring records as necessary. The State Archives offers a couple of different options for storing records, and sometimes there's some confusion as to what our services are because we have two different facilities. This first facility that you see is the State Records Center in Clearfield. This facility is a warehouse type storage center. It is not humidity or temperature controlled, so it's intended for inactive records that um, most likely will be destroyed at some point. Um, agencies can transfer records to the State Records Center and store them here for free. The agency just is required to purchase the boxes from Office Depot and to get the records to the Records Center. If your agency chooses to store records in the Records Center, the custody of the records would remain with your agency. And what that means is that if someone, say, puts in a grammar request to access records that your agency is storing in the Records Center, you would contact the Records Center to retrieve those records and you would handle the grammar request. Um, you can also just ask for your records to be returned to your office if you need them, and you can either um, keep them in your office or you can return them to the records center. So it's it's a service again that's free, and it's something that we provide. Um, but you still have uh, quite you still have access to your to your records if they're stored there. The second storage facility is the archives, and this is. Um, the facility that is in downtown Salt Lake City. And the storage chair is intended for historical records only. So these are permanent records. The facility is humidity and temperature controlled, so it is designed to take care of records for a very long period of time. And um, records are transferred to the archives once the agency really has no administrative need for those records. And um, when the records are transferred to the archives, custody is also transferred, meaning if any, you know, if we got any grammar requests for those records, then we would handle that request. Um, we are subject to the same requirements under grandma as any other government agency. Most records do not come to us until they are public, um, but there are a few exceptions with that. And then as far as accessing those records, the public can come to our research center and request that. So those are the two different um, storage options, and both are free. Okay, then step 10 is destroy records as necessary. Um, we've talked a lot about retention, and so retention is the time period in which the record is to remain in the custody of the agency. Once that retention has been met, then the record will either be destroyed or it will be kept permanently. And that will depend on the retention schedule. I'm not going to get into specifics on that. But if the disposition is destroyed, then the record should be destroyed. Um, retentions are not just a minimum. And all copies of a record should be destroyed at the same time as the record copy. So if you think back, we talked about how there could be a lot of different copies of a record. Once um, that record type has met its retention, if there's, you know, electronic copy, a paper copy as well, and the record retention schedule says um, that record needs to be destroyed, then both of those formats should be destroyed. Okay, and then just to end with, of course, um, we always like to know what we can do to make your job easier. If you have feedback about the records management training, please, please let us know. We um, take
take all the feedback that we get from people who attend our classes or just email us and we compile that and um, consider it as we plan future training classes and um, offerings. So please don't be shy. Let us know what we can do to help you more. With that, I'll just turn it over to Renee. Timothy. Oh, sorry, Timothy. Okay, I'll just wait a second for Timothy. I think everyone else's questions were answered. Oh, Tim, Tim is this for you, Nova. <laughs> No. So, okay. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. This is Renee Wilson. Can you hear me? Noah, can you hear? I can hear. Yes, Renee. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, all right. So, the Open Records Portal is what I will be talking about and I am going to be asking you some questions well, just one question actually this question um, have you ever handled or responded to a grammar request Randall Knight, I just read your comments and I like it. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about making things easier for records officers. Uh, but I will say, uh, in case anyone didn't notice, Randall Knight's comment is that the recertification should be easier because the test questions are very similar. And uh, recertification just should just be a request. We did add links in several of the questions now to online uh, like the law which will show you where the answer is so that is one improvement that we have made and hopefully we will make more in the future um, anyway so let's look at this poll most of you have responded to a grammar request or handled a grammar request that is wonderful um, okay I'm going to maybe I'll just move that away for now Thank you for taking that so I can see. The Open Records portal is located at openrecords.utah.gov. This is what it looks like at the moment. And the portal has three different parts to it. So the first part is the actual records request portion, the grandma portion. This is where people can submit re records requests and you can receive grandma requests. You can respond to grammar requests. Uh, you can also input requests that are received outside of the portal. This is a new feature and it's pretty cool. And you can also download portal statistics and I will be showing you how to do all of this. The second part is the open records part which is not yet active and uh, yeah, not yet active. Still being planned, let's put it that way. So we just want to be able to give you lots of one place online to do lots of different things at the archives, uh, including uploading records and transferring records and creating record series and all sorts of things. So the third part of the portal is the records officer dashboard, which I'm assuming a lot of you did use already because you registered for this training session. You can also take the certification test there, update your personal contact information, enter unique fields for your agency's records request form. That's a new feature as well. So one really cool thing about the portal, um, this, this all came from legislation, of course, and the Open Utah website was modified to include this records request portal and also links to online records. This is where it is in the law. I'm not going to read this. The part that is relevant here is that this website serves as a point of access for grammar requests. So that is 
uh, what we have done, created this point of access. The portal opened in 2015 for state agencies and then last year for counties, municipalities, transit districts, and school districts. And this is, this is the cool thing I was meaning to say. It's that this year, 2017, it's open for you, which is cool because we've actually fixed a lot of the issues that we have had in the portal. So instead of giving you the very first version of it with lots of bugs and weird things going on, you actually get a, a more polished product with more features and even more being planned at the moment. So that is, I think, good for you. <laughs> so some of the questions that I have received most frequently for the portal the number one question is, do I have to use it? And the answer is kind of yes and no. The yes part is that if you do get a request on the portal, you have to actually go to the portal to access the request, but you don't have to respond to the request through the portal. You can actually just say, respond to it outside of the portal. The time limit starts for answering the request when you open the request. That is when the clock starts. It's not when the person submits it, unless you don't open it for 10 business days and then it's a denial. So it's actually kind of a, a boon for you that if you open it after it's been requested for two days, you still have 10 days to respond to it. Oh yes, you will also receive annoying emails from me each day that the request goes unopened. So that is a new feature as well. We have a lot of new features, which are all new for you. <laughs> uh, next question, do I need to create an account? Yes. And again, this is hopefully something that most of you have already done. You'll create a Utah Master Directory account, UMD. And the portal will guide you through this step by step. It's basically like signing up for an account on any other online website. You can call me or your records analyst for help if you want any help. And just a few tips to help you through that or help any other people who may need to do that. We do recommend that you use the same email that we have on file for you. If you're not sure what that is, then you can email your analyst or myself or really anyone, we can look it up. We also request or recommend that you use a specific work email address, not a generic work email. So if you have an email um, that is your agency name at whatever.com and everyone uses that email, we recommend you actually you make a different email or use a different email that only you access so it doesn't uh, cause problems in the system with multiple people trying to create an account. Oh, okay, I have a comment from Pamela Spencer. She says, I stated that I would be responding to the request outside of the portal and the portal still denied the request. I couldn't find a way to update the status of the request. So. Pamela, I'm going to assume that this happened recently and we did have an issue recently where the portal was not sending notifications, but also it was not changing the status of the request when the records officer responded to it. So even though you clicked request outside portal, it probably didn't change the status. Our system probably didn't change the status and then it just sat there and got denied, which is our fault, and I'm very sorry for that. We have fixed that problem, and if you ever need me to go back in the system and change the request, change the status, or anything like that, I can do that. Just talk to me, and um, I can go in and update that. So hopefully that should not be happening again. Okay, great. So yeah, like I said, we got lots of bugs worked out for you, but then there are always new bugs to deal with too. <laughs> um, so if you cannot log in, the best thing to do is try setting up a new account, even with your email that you already have an account with. If it says the email is already taken, try resetting the password 
that generally fixes most of the login issues. But again, I see new issues every single day. I always think, oh, okay, great, I've seen all the issues now, I can help anyone, but then I always get a new one. So let me know if you need help and I can help you. Next question, are the requests public? No, they are not public. Um, they do have a suggested designation of public according to their general retention schedule, but of course each agency classifies their own records and that includes your grammar requests through the portal. So we do not post them publicly to the web anywhere. The only people who can see them are the person who actually makes the request, the records officer, and then myself, and we can see the requests. We do try to discourage requesters from including sensitive information. Uh, that doesn't stop them from putting it in, but we do try to put warnings in there. Oh, like this. This is the text. Please do not submit any confidential information, such as social security number or account numbers. And then when they do submit the request, we have this notice as well. Grammar requests are public information. Again, we don't post them to the web publicly like some other agencies do, but we do have this on there to discourage uh, sensitive information. The requests are not kept forever. They will be deleted after two years according to the state schedule. And we haven't actually had any issues that I am aware of of people abusing the system. People do have to submit requests one at a time, so they can't just spam everyone at once. And um, I mean, we do have people who submit lots of requests, but that's uh, not quite the same as people abusing the system. So if you do believe someone is spamming you or um, trying to wreak havoc, please let me know and we can take care of it. So a few resources I want to point out for you before I show you more. When you go to the portal at openrecords.utah.gov, at the very bottom is a button that says Help Center. This is a bunch of articles and how-tos that I have put together. And um, if you ever see or don't see a, something there that you want to see there, you can let me know and I can create a page on how to do that. So if I do get questions that I think would be beneficial to multiple people, then I'll create a new page there. Again, hopefully we're making the Open Records portal intuitive enough that you don't need to access this help center, but if so, then hopefully it is there. Oh, how did I not include that question? I just got a question from Tina Lindsay. I've never used the portal, but if someone submits a grammar request, will I automatically be notified I have a request? Yes. And I don't know where that, I used to have that as a frequently asked question. Anyway, you will be notified. There will be an email that is sent to you. If you would rather have it sent to a generic address for your agency, we can do that as well. So, um, yes, you will get notified. Another resource for you at the bottom of the screen on the main page of the portal is the frequently asked questions link. And this is uh, mostly about grammar stuff, the law, time limits, other other questions. And um, yeah, again, if you don't see a question, let us know and we can add it. And then the contact us, of course. We actually do like to hear from you. I really love getting feedback on what's working and what's not. So let us know if you have questions or feedback. So let me show you how this works. The actual request submission, oh, here it is. So the requester will find your agency, submit a request, and then you'll get notified you have a request, and then you respond to the request. That is the basic breakdown of what happens. So the requester comes to the main page, they click on one of these buttons. This is the screen they'll see. A uh, little we'll zoom in here so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, your Records officer information is there online, so if you are ever unsure of what's showing up online, you can look it up and check it out. And then they click this Request Records button to submit a request. This is the form. If any of you are familiar with the generic 
grammar form that we have online. This is pretty much that same form, just in electronic format. We also have that form in this presentation. If you look on the screen, kind of in the top right, there's a little box that says files. That grammar request form is in there. That's the, our generic form. So let me just go through this quickly. At the top of the form is your agency information. And then the actual records request part where they type in what they are looking for. Next comes their information, the requester information. And then if they are requesting restricted records, they can tell you that they have power of attorney or a notarized release. Um, again, it's up to you to verify that however you choose. They can upload documents here with their request. So if they uploaded a scan of their request, they could do that. But again, it's up to you whether or not you need to see something in person, have them mail it in. Um, it's each agency decides how to determine that. And then our favorite part, they can state whether they want a fee waiver, of course, because who wouldn't want a fee waiver, right? Um, and also if they would like an expedited response, they can state that here as well. Then at the very bottom of the screen is where they click submit or they can upload documents as well and submit at the same time. So that is the request form. Your side of things will look a little bit different. This is what you will see now. Um, we have two different views here. One is the dashboard and that includes notifications. So that'll tell you like if you have your certification expiring soon or any upcoming trainings. And then news will just be uh, any news items that we have going on. And right now you can see it looks kind of blank. That'll be more populated in the future as we get that rolling more. The records requests are found underneath. If you click on the records request button, that is basically the same thing but without the two boxes at the top so it just shows you the records requests. So on the requests when you're looking at them you can click any of the top uh, top row items and that'll sort by that feature facet by that facet. And then to open a request this is how you open a request you just click anywhere on the request and that is what starts the timer. So Clicking on the request opens it and that starts the timer. Unless you click this little circle, which is the plus sign, that kind of drops down the request so you can see a little preview of the request without actually opening it. If you want to see requests that are already closed or previous requests, right now it's hidden a little bit, but um, we plan to make that more visible in the future. For right now, it's under the advanced search. If you click on only open requests and then change it to no and then click the apply filter button, then it will show you all the requests that you've ever had. And I don't expect you guys to remember all of this. This is a lot, um, but hopefully you can take some time to play around on the portal. If you want a sample request, like just a test request, I can send you a test request or you can create a user account and send one yourself. Um, but yeah, if you do want a test request, let me know and I can send it to you so you can try different things on the portal and see how it works. The reports button at the bottom will show you your agency statistics. It doesn't actually give you a report, it gives you a spreadsheet of data. And so you can select which agency, if you're a records officer from more than one agency, and it will give you that spreadsheet. This is a really cool little button down here, the new request. So if you would like to use the portal to track all of your requests, then you can definitely do that. We have added the ability for you to be able to, um, to put records requests in the portal that you did not receive through the portal. Okay, hold on just one second.
Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so let me show you how this works. It's a very cool thing. You click the new request button and you basically just fill out the information the same as if you were the requester yourself. So you just fill it all in and that's it. And then it gets added to your requests. So for answering a request, let me show you how to do that. So here on the screen, you click a request to open it. And this is what the screen looks like. Uh, it's kind of a lot there to look at visually. So let me break it down for you again so we can just take a look at each little section. The top of the request is the title, due date, fee, if you have any fee. I'll show you more about that later. The status, and then if they put in a date range for the records, then it will show up there as well. The description is next. As you notice, this is one big ugly blob of text. Um, our, we will be fixing that soon so that the text actually holds the formatting rather than turning into a big blob of text. I apologize for the big blob. Uh, for now, that is what it looks like, but it will be getting fixed soon. Then if they did submit any, uh, if they did state that they have rights to the records, like the power of attorney or anything like that, that will show up underneath. And then there's a little, oh yes, right there. Power of attorney or notarized release will show up there. If they want the fee waiver, it'll show up there. And then if they want an expedited request, it'll show up there. There's a more detail button underneath that. It will list the requester information, like the name and their email and a couple other little things. This is the print request button. So if you need to print the request, you can do that. And for any of you who have printed the request, I just want to tell you that we have a new template that will be applied soon. So the printed requests will look better. The close request button, okay, I need to tell you about this button. This, um, don't use this button. This button doesn't actually do anything. And it will be going away soon, but just don't use it. Uh, it used to do something, now it doesn't. It will just annoy you. And I'm very sorry for that, but uh, it will go away soon. I promise. Okay. The respond to request outside portal button is a wonderful button. If you need to respond outside of the portal, just click that button and it will close the request. So underneath that, we have the different parts of the request. Most requests just have one part, the main request, but uh, if they have, if they requested it to be expedited or have a fee waiver, that'll show up there because you need to respond to that. Approve or deny that separately from the actual records request. So you can click on whichever part you want to address. Underneath that table, you will see the information for that portion of the request that you are responding to at the moment. This little button is really cool to divide request into parts. So if you have a request that you have to like approve part of it and deny part of it, you can click this button and, and it would basically just create another request portion so that you can approve one part and then deny the other part. And I think you can do quite, I've never tested how many different portions you can create, but you can do quite a few. Down at the very bottom is all the really exciting stuff because this is where you interact to respond to the requests. So the approve button is first and you can put in the message and uh, how you will deliver the records or how they will pick up the records, either one. You can upload files and right now we have a file upload limit of, uh, for each file, the limit is 30 megabytes. But right here in the approve section, you can upload one file, but we have a pla other places where you can upload files as well which I will show you. Um, so as soon as you approve the request, a notification is sent to the requester with your message and a message telling them how they will be receiving the records. <clears throat> and that is sent automatically. The denial also sends an email automatically to the requester 
with information about how to appeal the request, the legal requirements. So you don't need to worry about typing that in. That will be automatically included. The, your chief administrative officer information will auto-populate if um, you, you do need to verify it to make sure that it's correct. And if you need to send the denial to anyone else, like if your um, CAO would like a copy of denials or anything like that, you can uh, CC or BCC that person in. The extraordinary circumstances, again, this sends a notification. Um, pretty much anything you do down here sends a notification to the requester that something has happened with their request so that they can keep track of what's going on. As Nova mentioned, there are eight extraordinary circumstances, and we list them all here. You can select whichever one or ones apply. And then depending on what you pick, you will be able to select the date when the records will be made available to you or approved or denied or whatever. The next tab option is a referral. So just a note, the portal does not actually send records requests to other records officers. So this, if you select referral, it does not send the request to that other agency. It just tells the requester, you need to go talk to this other person. So you can send a, or give a referral to a records officer, a particular person, if you know who the person is, or you can just refer the person to a particular agency, or if you want to just write it in free form, you can do that. There's also this little button here, does not exist referral. This is one of the things that we will be making more visible in the future. But if the records just do not exist, then this is where to find it right now. Um, the does not exist referral. And if you would like a quick reference guide to kind of what these different options are down here, the approve, deny, refer, uh, in the files box on the screen, you will see a portal reference sheet that is a PDF that is designed so that you can print it as a two-page booklet for a quick reference if you would like. Fees. All right, fees are next. Fees are um, exciting because we have two different kinds of fee. The first fee here is a, an item fee. So if you have um, just a particular number of items that have a set cost to them, you can put them in here. Anything that you enter into the fees down here will show up at the top of the screen. And the requester does see this portion of the screen, so they will see the total fee for requests. And um, anything that you enter into the fees will be automatically added to the total. When you click on total, the total fees for the request, it will take you to a page that breaks it down for you, so you can see uh, all the different fees that have been applied. And I will show you the other fee in just a moment. The contact requester button is the next option down here. And this, is, this just sends an email to the requester. However, it sends it through our system. So if the requester clicks to reply, then it will not go to you. Um, so if you would like your email to be tracked through the portal, then you can send it here. And then um, anything that the requester sends in reply, I actually uh, reply to them and tell them to do it through the portal. So hopefully you do get their reply, but it's, it's the same as an email. <coughs> the other button has some pretty cool stuff under it. Tasks are the other type of fee that we have. So if you want to, um, well, here we go. This is how you set it up. You, you can state this is something a person had to do, like um, do this particular research or formatting or anything like that. And then you can state the billable rate, uh, which is all in the law, and then, um, and then how many hours it took. 
So you state how much per hour, how many hours it took, and then you click save, and then that automatically adds that total to the total fee. The documents, this is where you go for uploads. We're in the process of changing the wording so that it says uploads. But right now it says reference documents. So references means uploads. Uh, there is a 30 megabyte limit per file, but there is no file limit as far as I know. At least I've uploaded 106 files before giving up and doing something else. So I know you can at least upload 106 files. Also, if the requester uploads a file, this is where you will find the uh, upload. So I got a really good question from Eileen Condor, which I failed to answer. Uh, where does the money go when fees are required? We unfortunately don't actually collect money through the portal yet. It's a feature that I would like to implement in the future, but right now we don't because it involves money. Uh, <laughs> But however your agency collects those fees, just keep doing that. And someday we will have that for you and everything will be sunshine and rainbows. So, uh, yeah, sorry for the disappointing answer. Oh, look, here we go. There's a sample of a bunch of different stuff uploaded. So yeah, uploads are under the reference. Uh, notes are next. So if you need to add a note, you can. You can state whether the requester will see the note, too. And if I do anything to the, to the request, then I will leave a note as well. And that's only like if you need me to, if you uh, accidentally close it and I need to reopen it, then I will put a note there. Uh, this person contacted me and requested me to reopen it and blah, blah, blah. Okay, <clears throat> and then the log, you can see everything that happened to the request. Randall Knight has a comment that your accountant should know what account to put the money in. Yes, thank you. Uh, the log is also being updated so that it's worded better so you understand who did what, but that can also be found there. And that is, that. that's the whole thing right there, the whole request. There's a lot to it and a lot of different things you can do. Um, so we do want to know if you do have special records request needs or you're already using an online request system. Also, of course, if you have questions or concerns, we want to know if you have suggestions. I get some really good suggestions from our, um, I call them our power users, our requesters who put in a lot of requests, they give me a lot of good suggestions, so I, I appreciate knowing those things. And then if you like the portal, you know, that's nice to know too, so thanks for everyone who gives feedback. So the bottom line is, um, what does this mean for you? If you get a request from the portal, then you need to respond to it, just like you would any other request. If you don't respond to it, then it'll be timed out and marked as a denial, and then they can appeal the denial, so... That's pretty much it. Okay, so I received a question from Chris Calton. Since we can adopt our own fee schedules, is there a way that the requester would be able to see what our fees are ahead of time, or do they just get the bill and then find out how much it would it will cost? Um, I, I honestly thought we put in a way to do that, but I don't think we did. It's on our it's on our radar. It is something we want to do to put in the fee schedules. Um, they do get a notice anytime that you add a fee, but that's not the same as a fee schedule. Um, so that is on our list of things to add to the portal. Right now, it does not show, but you can put in a link to a fee schedule if you have a fee schedule listed online. You could definitely do that. Uh, why wouldn't the fee be included in the response? Well, it's not included in the approval or denial email, but it is a included in 
when the fee is applied or created, then the notice is sent at that moment. But that's not a bad thought to include it in the response. Um, I have to think about how that would work, but yeah, I will think about that. That's a good idea. Okay, Rhonda says, if I understand correctly, once we set up an account, then we would be able to receive the request by email. Is that correct? You will receive a notification by email that you have a request. You won't actually receive the request by email. Okay. But it will go to the email on the set information. Yes. It will go to whatever information we have for you. So whatever email we have you on file for you. Yeah. And again, let us know if you want that changed. We can change it to whatever you want. Okay. Let me show you some other tools. Oh, the dashboard. We are on the dashboard now. Okay. Um, so the next part of the portal is the dashboard, which I kind of showed you a little, but there are these other buttons here, which are handy dandy. The training, you can do your certification on the portal, and it will show you this screen that has a lot of information on it. So there's shows you whether you're certified or not, and then the date that you need to renew by. Ooh, that is overdue, isn't it? Whew. Okay. Uh, this is an old screenshot, as you can tell. Now, if you're not certified, um, this should be showing me a big red X because I'm not certified anymore. But anyway, um, then you can see the different tests that are available, as uh, Nova and Lorian talked about. And your test history, which I really love this part. You can see all the different tests that you've taken. If you need to reprint your certificate, you can do it right here and it'll show up. If it's not showing up, um, let us know and we can take a look. And then if you did miss any questions in your test, you can't see those missed questions. You will not see which of the answers is the correct answer, but you will see which answer you selected, so you can not select it again. And as you notice, my second test down there, I got 100%. If you get 100%, you will not see the View Missed Questions button because you didn't miss any questions. So, if you're confused as to why that's not there, that may be the reason. You can also register for training on this wonderful screen here, which I'm thinking most of you probably did. But it's super easy. You just click Register for this class, and then you're registered. Under My Account, you have your profile, and you can update your information there at any point. You can also update your agency information now um, under the agency detail. You can select whichever agency you want to change and then click on that and see the agency information. We did have a question the other day um, on why can't you change the chief administrative officer. Only the chief administrative officers can change who the chief administrative officer is which I think for local districts, um, not sorry, not local districts, but local agencies such as municipalities and counties can be somewhat of a challenge because the CAO may not be, uh, maybe someone who changes regularly, like the mayor, mayor or someone else. But um, for now, that is how it's set up and we are looking for a solution to make that more useful for the future so that you can change the information if you need to. This really cool thing I have to show you because it is fantastic. Custom request fields. So if you need particular information for people submitting requests, like um, if you need a victim name or someone's mother, then you can create a new custom field. It's down on the bottom left corner. And create a field that they have to fill out every time that they fill out the form. And there are lots of different fields you can pick. There's the date, text, number, multiple choice, or drop down, whatever. Um, and you can select several different different fields together. And then once you have them, they are included on the request form so that the requester 
has to fill that out and you will receive that information. One quick note about the transparency board. <clears throat> um, if you do have any large scale legislative concerns, Deidre Henderson is the, well, the transparency board is basically the, the group that we report to on our progress with the portal and what we're doing with it. So they are the ones who, uh, we work with them to create all this and make it happen. So they give us guidance. If you have questions or, or big concerns, they do like feedback from people who actually use the portal and our records officers. So Deidre Henderson is the senator on the board and she's a very nice person and likes to hear from people. John Reedhead is the chair and Patricia Smith Mansfield, who is also our state archivist, is the vice chair. Open records portal, that's me. Information, right there, okay. Um, this will be online, the slides and presentation. So if you need any contact information, don't worry. It will be there. Um, I'm trying to get to, I thought I had some other slides here as well, but I might not, this might be the end. I think this is the end, folks. Okay, so um, is, are there any questions? You've done a great job of asking questions throughout, so I really appreciate all the questions. There have been good questions. Um, the slides you can see are in that box that says files, presentation slides, those are up there. Um, I will be posting this recording to YouTube hopefully early next week. I actually will have a little bit of time now that some other projects are done. So um, again, if you have any questions, let me know. I will be emailing you each your certificate and a link to the recording once it's posted. So I will email that to each of you. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. You have a wonderful day. Oh, look, a question. Pamela. <clears throat> Pamela Spencer, you stated that we are sort of required to use the portal. <laughs> if we get a request outside of the portal, do we have to put it in the portal? Absolutely not. I mean, you can if you want to, but, but no. No, definitely not. My permit and grammar certificates were exactly the same. Exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Oh, does it specify which one that they took on there, or does it just say it should specify on there? Yeah, they look the same. They look the same? Okay, we will look into this. And the, the, one says records management, yeah. one says records access. Oh, one says, okay, one says records management, and one says records access. So they're apparently exactly the same, except for that little word. So take a look, and if they are the same, 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 <laughs> uh, let us know and we'll take a look as well. Um, but they should, one should say records access and one records management. Yeah, okay. Still has someone typing. Great, thanks everyone. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's kind of a complex system, and it stores your email in various places. So let me write down your name, and I will take a look and, <clears throat> and figure out what's going on. So um, yeah, and I think I actually have your email because I've communicated with you before, too. So. Okay.
Great. So that is the one that you want to be using. Great. Okay. I will take a look at that and let you uh, get back to you. Make sure that that's what we have for you throughout our whole system. Okay. Thanks.